that's a common critique that you'll hear from people that when you're being so inclusive, you're neglecting this potential problem. What are your thoughts on that? Is being nice to ourselves somehow keeping us sort of complacent or status quo. And my area of research is really focused on self-compassion, offering the same kindness and care that you give to your friends or people that you love to yourself. And one of the biggest roadblocks of practicing self-compassion is people's belief that if I'm not a jerk to myself, then I won't be motivated. And that's not what the research shows, actually. We see that people with higher levels of self-compassion experience higher levels of motivation. Um, they're kinder to themselves when they face adversity or difficulties. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Movement and Performance Podcast, where it is my goal to guide individuals in taking an informed approach to fitness. Today, I have with me Natalie Marguerite Papini. She's a professor at Northern Arizona University with expertise in self-compassion, weight inclusivity, and body image. Her research focuses on promoting mental health and well-being through these areas. Today's episode will be discussing body positivity. Without further ado, let's get right into it. All right, so today we're talking about body positivity. And um, I wanna jump right into the convo. How would you define body positivity? Yeah, so body positivity is really accepting your body regardless of your shape, your body shape, your body size, um, skin tone, skin sort of imperfections or blemishes, um, and even physical ability. So I think so, a lot of times when you see the term body positivity, people are talking about shape and size, um, but it's important to sort of recognize that it does go beyond um, body shape and size and even extends into um, accepting bodies that maybe aren't able-bodied or um, you know, bodies that aren't maybe what society deems as ideal or acceptable. It almost seems like a no-brainer to me. Why would this be important, right? But just t hearing it in your words, why is that important for people to consider? Yeah, it's important for a lot of reasons. It, you know, absolutely has implications for our health. Um, people who experience body dissatisfaction are at higher risk for developing eating disorders. Um, people with uh, who have high body dissatisfaction or a lot of body shame have reduced quality of life, um, and they're less likely to engage in certain health behaviors like exercise and physical activity. Um, so, you know, especially for me, I think the piece that I'm most interested in is that quality of life piece, mm. um, which really just kind of uh, makes it so that people's everyday is better <laughs> and they're operating and functioning in the world in a way that's more positive and, and healthier. Um, and so those are sort of the big ones of why this is important. Um, and it's an area of research that I think could be infused into so many different health um, aspects and, and sort of components. Do you think that this is something that all people struggle with to some degree? Yeah. And, you know, I'm, um, I'm an assistant director of a health coaching program at my university and it's a non-diet, um, weight inclusive health coaching program. And so we really stress to our clients, which we serve faculty and students and staff that mm -hmm. everybody has bad body image days. You know, mm -hmm. there's not a single person I've ever met that feels a hundred percent confident about their body a hundred percent of the time. Uh, so I do think it's normal for people, for everyone to have sort of this recognition of what that feels like. Now, some people definitely experience it more than others. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with sort of our societal ideal of what our bodies should look like, both men and women. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, it definitely impacts everybody, but for some people, uh, a lot more than others. And we'll dive into that convo a little bit more as well. But before I do, I want to hit on one of the big ones. So, because it's, I think it's important for people to have buy-in because then the other stuff uh, is easier to hear when you actually believe, oh, okay, this is something valuable. But um, there's some people that say there's this potential disconnect between uh, like what maybe is happening in reality, right? So like if I have 
you know, maybe some type of issue or, you know, obesity is a big one because I'm dealing with fitness. So of course, there's many realms of body positivity, but if someone has this real issue uh, and then is it potentially sugarcoating it? Now, that's not what I feel, but that's a common critique that you'll hear from people that when you're being so inclusive, you're neglecting this potential problem and acting as if it's okay and there may not be this urgency to fix it. And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, so I'll try to keep them organized. But um, yeah. I just, you know, part of weight stigma, which is stigma toward people in larger bodies, um, mm. is this sort of idea that we can shame people into being more physically active. Mm. We know that that doesn't work. We mm. also know that people in larger bodies often avoid fitness spaces because they're concerned about being judged or shamed because of their body weight and body size. Mm. Um, so I think having a more inclusive approach is really, it backfires in a lot of ways and it keeps people who otherwise might be physically active out of those spaces um, and really creates a lot of health equity issues in that way. Um, I think also at the heart of your question is this idea of like, if we are able to accept ourselves and our bodies as they are currently, is that being too soft or like, is being nice to ourselves somehow keeping us sort of complacent or status quo? And um, my area of research is really focused on self-compassion. Uh, mm. So it's, you know, offering the same kindness and care that you give to your friends or people that you love to yourself. Um, and one of the most sort of like biggest roadblocks of practicing self-compassion is people's belief that if I'm not a jerk to myself, then I won't be motivated. Yeah. Um, and that's not what the research shows. Actually, we see that people with higher levels of self-compassion experience higher levels of motivation. Um, they're kinder to themselves when they face adversity or difficulties, which mm. as you're aware, you know, when you're starting an exercise routine, stuff like that comes up. Mm. Um, and I think this is such an interesting area to explore in fitness spaces because, um, so many fitness professionals are scratching their heads. Like, why can't I keep people invested in this program? Or why can't I help someone sort of sustain these behaviors long-term, well, you know, if someone's feeling like crap about themselves nine out of 10 times when they leave your workout, why are they going to go back? You know, right. Um, right. So I think if we can help people and be, you know, make sure that our spaces are inclusive, that we have equipment that sort of caters to people in all different sizes, that we understand that just because someone's maybe coming in in a larger body doesn't mean that they have zero experience in a gym. Um, you know, if we can really sort of understand our own personal biases around weight and size and bodies. Um, but then also to help people extend compassion to themselves when the workout sucks or be kind to themselves when it's really hard and they don't want to keep doing it. Like, what would you say to a friend in that moment kind of thing? Um, we may be able to sort of help them enjoy it more, or if they don't enjoy it more, at least be kinder to themselves while they're suffering. Um, right. So yeah, I, you know, I think that's sort of where my mind goes when I hear that like fear of being complacent. And I'd also just add that people with higher levels of self-compassion take more risks and they mm -hmm. take more risks because they know that they can sort of soothe or regulate their emotions when they're experiencing failure, challenges, adversity. Right. Yeah, those are a lot of really good points. So my background is um, mostly physical education. There's a lot that I do. But one of the biggest things I always preach is I say, you know, kids having a positive experience in your class has to be at the forefront. Because if you don't enjoy it, there's just tons of research to show if I'm and like it all doesn't have to be fun and games, right? Like you can have challenge, you can have tough obstacles, you can have things you have to overcome, you can lose, right? So a positive experience doesn't mean that there's this lack of challenge, uh, but it does mean that when people have a positive association with this, when they experience some success or all those things, they're more likely to do it, you know? And if I wanna create buy-in and I want people to come back, you know, my goal is to get the masses to move, not just the people that are uh, already fit, to be more fit, you know? And I think that's a lot of times what we're doing. So would you say, and you know, this is another, th 
this is more of a thought process in myself. I'm sure others think it too, but there are people who are starting at these different genetic uh, places. So it's almost like you're, you have this unfair advantage. You know, someone who or has this great body. I, I use the analogy of tanning a lot of times that a lot of times, you know, we have our skin color and you can get lighter, you could get darker, but you still have this genetic window of how far you can go. So, and I think um, we can all grow, we can all get better, but some people are gifted with something that others might not have, like you, just an amazing body. And so now here you are making these claims as if it was just through fitness. However, it was blessed from genetics. And, you know, so you have this confidence and all these things, but someone else has a much further gap and hurdle to overcome to get that confidence that you have. Like, would you say that there is this genetic gap uh, and that it is harder for people, some others to get there? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely research out there to support that genetics and biology play a huge role in body diversity and different body shapes and sizes. Um, I have a unique experience teaching fitness wellness students. So a lot of my students go on to become personal trainers or physical therapists or athletic trainers. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that we talk about in, in my classes is just that there are so many influencers out there who are talking because they sort of have this genetic predisposition toward thinness. Um, and people are following what they're doing without really questioning it. So like they're putting cayenne pepper on everything because this person <laughs> right. who's thin said that that's what they do. And, um, I think there's a lot of wellness misinformation out there that gets spread because the person who issued it looks like what our society says is healthy. Mm. Uh, and in reality, you know, so you can't tell someone's health from their shape and their size. I know plenty of people in larger bodies who are more physically active than other people in smaller bodies who eat really, you know, nutritionally dense foods that people in smaller bodies don't eat. Um, so I think everyone has this sort of like snap judgment. We see someone in a larger body come in and we immediately think that person doesn't engage in health behaviors or, you know, some of the stereotypes of, of weight stigma, right? That they're lazy or that they lack willpower, none yeah. of which is true. All of which though, that person experiences on a daily level. So then we kind of get into just the stress of being stigmatized, right? For mm -hmm. something that is a lot of times outside of a person's control. Do you think that people can benefit from being more empathetic to a variety of populations? Absolutely. Yeah. No question. Um, empathetic, but also too, just like, I think a lot of times socially, like in media, we dehumanize people in larger bodies. Like you'll see a news story, um, and it'll be, you know, a person in a larger body and their head will be cut off and they'll be wearing ill-fitting clothing. And it'll be a story about, you know, weight or something in the news. Well, that dehumanizes people in larger bodies that takes away their humanness and it doesn't really um, portray them in a positive light. And I think even just some of those types of media that we're all exposed to pretty frequently has a way of sort of seeping into how we interact and treat people in larger bodies in our everyday interactions. So there's just so much work to be done in the space, but I do believe that it starts with empathy and um, not just in fitness, but in healthcare and education. Um, in interpersonal relationships with family and friends, like we really need to think about how we speak to people in larger bodies and the messages that we may be communicating that we don't even realize. Right. Yeah. I often say as an educator, you, there's twofold or whether you're thinking personal trainer or anything like that, but you have your content, but you also have how you deliver that content and the delivery is just as important if you claim to be an educator unless you claim to be a lecturer maybe or something else but like if you claim to be an educator you have to consider the population you're dealing with and i think based on what you're saying research is also showing that people are going to buy in more and participate more when they um feel better about themselves yeah and i'll, I'll give an example too 
I think a lot of times we think about weight stigma as like really specific comments that someone makes to someone, but a lot of that literature shows that it's a death by a thousand cuts. It's not the person who says something ridiculous to them. It's the hundred people at the grocery store that glance in their cart while mm. they're shopping. It's the 15 people in the gym that keep looking over at them while they're working out. Mm. Right. So I think just even knowing that a lot of times it's nonverbal, um, but being thoughtful about that delivery, like you said, it's not just what you're doing, but how you're doing it. Um, mm. And yeah, making sure that we make sure our spaces are accommodating to people in all body sizes and shapes. Mm. So for the people that do have to deal with that, um, are there any strategies, you know, and like you said, I think everybody at some point in their life is, is going to deal with this in one way or another, whether it's through aging, whether it's through the little thing about you that no one knows and you don't say, <laughs> you know, or I think we all have it. But when we all go through that experience and some more than others, are there any strategies to be able to help in those situations? Yeah. And this is an area that I, when I started doing research, I was focused in on. And then a couple of years ago, it kind of dawned on me that in some ways it's kind of stigmatizing to tell the person who's experiencing stigma that it's their responsibility also to cope with it. Mm. Right. So I, I kind of see this as twofold. Number one, we need to do better collectively, socially, societally to minimize, mitigate, improve weight stigma or, you know, stigmatizing experiences that we put onto other people in larger bodies. Like the environment in which these people are expected to live needs to change. It's mm. really not their responsibility to cope with the stigma that other people are putting or are putting out there, you know? Um, mm. But then secondly, yeah, I think that's where I see self-compassion as being so important because it is an emotion regulation tool. It's taking a moment, it's pausing and going, man, this really sucks. It's being mindful. It's not trying to like ignore it or hope that it goes away. It's being in the present moment and recognizing that it's hard. It's also saying, you know, I this is challenging and difficult and it sucks right now, but also other people go through it too. So this piece of common humanity that really helps us understand that experiencing that sort of isolation or tough time is part of what it means to be human and that we all experience it in, on some level. And then it's extending kindness to yourself. So, you know, what do I need to do or say to myself right now to support myself through this? Or what would I say to a really good friend of mine who's going through the same experience? How would I, you know, speak to them? That way we sort of change our internal dialogue from, well, you deserve it because da, 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 like where we be, where we're really mean to ourselves. And instead, you know, we say things to ourselves that we would oftentimes never say to someone that we love. And I know mm -hmm. I have friendships where we just roast each other back and forth, but like for the most part, we don't say nearly as many mean or damaging things to other people that we care about as we do to ourselves. So um, one thing that is helpful if you're trying to practice self-compassion when you're in a challenging moment is to just say, you know, that thought that I just had, would I say that to my niece? Would I say that to my sister who's going through this? Mm. And if the answer is no, then that tells you, okay, that wasn't a very self-compassionate thought. What's mm. a nicer way or a kinder way I can treat myself? Mm. Yeah. I think it's important to note too, that like, it's not just about and first off, making people feel better should be enough of a reason, right? But it's also not just about making yourself or others feel better. It is like there's tons of science behind, I think, how this will improve your performance, your productivity, your every area of your life. It's not simply, oh, you know, we're just being soft and making people, it's, 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 and impacting everything and it's making you better in every way um and right if i'm not mistaken there's been a lot of studies on positive self-talk yeah no i mean it, i there the last couple of years there's been quite a few studies published on self-compassion with elite athletes olympic mm -hmm. athletes again because you're going to experience challenge and adversity and 
you can beat yourself up and kind of drill sergeant yourself through it and be miserable, or there's this other kinder approach that actually might help increase your motivation a little bit more and get you through it in a more positive way. And so, you know, I know I, I throw out there elite athletes and Olympians, but I think too, for the person that's never been fit or like had a fitness routine or had physical activity in their life, this can also apply because you're going to go through challenge and adversity. You're going to experience struggle and setback and, you know, failure. How are you going to treat yourself when that happens? And can we as fitness professionals help people learn these skills so that they're able to get through it in a kinder, gentler way and persist mm. with the behavior? What are your thoughts on a self-compassion letter writing to yourself? Yeah. So Kristen Neff is the self-compassion lady. Her website is incredible. It's uh, selfcompassion.org. And there are exercises on there that she uses often in her research. Uh, one of them is writing yourself a compassion, self-compassionate letter. That is mm. one of the exercises on the website. And it can be a really good experience for some people. I have some students in my classes that hate writing, so mm. they don't want to like physically write down on paper. You can also use like notes in your cell phone. Um, right. Some of the other exercises on there that have been a big hit are souls on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is sort of a mindfulness practice where you really connect your feet to the ground below you. You notice shifts in your weight. It's a grounding exercise that kind of keeps you in the present moment rather than worrying about the future or ruminating on the past. Um, mm -hmm. And a self-compassionate break is my one of my favorites, just taking some time out and taking a break from something, doing something that's rejuvenating, whether it's going outside for some fresh air or you know, doing a lap around the building if it's bad weather or something, um, but just right. kind of treating yourself kindly when you need it. Right. Yeah. But you said about like having your feet firmly on the ground, I guess any form of meditation for that matter, which for most of the time when I'm practicing meditation, it's to bring me to the present moment, whether I'm focused on breathing or something, but I'm sure any meditation can help. Yeah. Yeah. And um, some of the protocols that I've used in my studies, she has guided meditations on her website. Truly, mm -hmm. if you're interested, if anyone's interested in practicing self-compassion, she does such a great job of making sure those resources are available to people. Um, but there is, a, I know there's a guided loving kindness meditation. There's an affectionate breathing guided meditation. Um and so those are ones that I've used in different research studies where we're seeing if self-compassion meditation can improve body image and other things. And I would think too, any activity that gets you to be in the zone or to get into a flow state, like I always bring it up because I'm currently using ultimate Frisbee in my exercise routine. So and I played yesterday, so it's like fresh on my mind and I keep bringing it up a lot recently. But um, when I get on the field and I play, nothing else exists. Like my phone, there's no thought about the past, no thought about the future. I'm there, I'm moving, I'm engaged. So I would assume that moments like that, anytime you experience flow in your life, like try to remember those moments and what gives you that experience and try to repeat it more often so that you can be in the present moment. Do you think that can also help? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, you know, self-compassion has these three distinct parts, one of which is mindfulness. And mm. it's that present moment awareness. I'm not worried about the notifications on my phone. I'm not worried about what I'm going to eat for dinner later or my never ending to-do list. You know, it's having that experience of like, all there is, is this moment. And can we, you know, even if this moment currently sucks, can we still be in it? <laughs> and mm. that's some of the trickier stuff where it's like, even if the present moment is kind of miserable, there is some benefit in recognizing like, yeah, I'm experiencing pain and what can I learn from this? Or how can I, you know, get through it in a positive way? And from my understanding, I think I read this somewhere and maybe you can confirm if it's accurate or not. But there's the people that live in the present moment more, even if it's an unhappy present moment, tend to be happier than those who are mind wandering all the time. 
I, it wouldn't surprise me. I haven't, I don't know that right. I've, I can think of a specific study I've read on that, but it, right. you know, there's a lot of benefit of staying present, um, rumination and sort of this incessant worry. And it's so hard because we really haven't like evolved for the constant, the 24 hour news cycle and the constant group texts and all the things that want to take us out of this moment now, or mm. even just the escape of social media, right? Mm. Like all of these things. And it's, it's actually really challenging to stay in the present moment. Mm. Um, it's something that is a skill and it takes time and practice, but the benefit is, and, and again, just from research, but also personal experience, when I'm in a consistent meditation routine, I'm not clicking around from tab to tab all day and getting nothing done. I'm going, mm -hmm. nope, I'm working on this right now. And when I'm done with this, then I can move here. It's basically training your mind to just be in one place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it sounds so easy, but it's really difficult sometimes when this email comes through that we feel like we have to get to right now or you know, you got to go pick up your kids and da, 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 you know, it's, we're doing a lot in 24 hours. And so having the ability to sort of focus on one thing at a time can be really beneficial. Yeah. I almost feel like for myself, something that's been very effective is uh, just not having the thing present. So meaning uh, like leave your phone in the car when you go for the hike, that might sound like the hardest thing ever or a walk or whatever it is. But if you have, when I have it with me, the urge to check and the fact that it's readily available is just like almost irresistible. Same thing for me with cookies and things like that. You know, uh, I might not look like it, but I'm, I love sugar. And so I just don't buy it. I don't have it in my house. And then the urge is much less. But, um, you know, just some things to think about there. But um, so moving on just a little bit, there was something I was reading that um, I found from you that said health at every size or the health at every size movement. What is that movement? And can you talk a little more about it? Health at every size is sort of a paradigm shift away from this idea that weight is the be all end all marker of health. Um, mm. So we're really focused on a non-diet approach toward nutrition and just overall health. Um, part of the, the Hayes um, paradigm is celebrating size diversity um, and helping people just focus on health behaviors rather than weight loss. And so um, I have a colleague at NAU and every year I guest lecture in her public health class um, and, and really the idea is helping public health professionals sort of think through what a weight inclusive approach would look like at a community level. Mm. Um, but the idea is that size doesn't determine your health. And um, we want people in all shapes and sizes and weights to have access and care to respectful care and, um, and that they're able to engage in health behaviors without stigma or shame. Um, mm. And so it is, a in my experience, it's as a practitioner, as someone who's been a health coach in weight loss, starting out and then moving into the health at every size approach, I really do believe that it's a more holistic approach and helps people long-term um, improve different health markers, cholesterol um, mm. and cardiovascular disease. Um instead of sort of this relentless pursuit of weight loss and yo-yo dieting. Yeah, I really love, there's something I read there and you, and you said it just before, but healthy eating habits over weight loss. I think when you focus on the healthy eating habits, you're focusing on what you have control over. And the alternative, I don't necessarily have control over. And, you know, when I used to compete, I used to, really use that strategy. I used to compete in the martial arts and then get out and I'd like perform in a sense. And it's like, what do I have control over in this moment? And those are the things I give my attention to because I don't have control of what the outcome is going to be or who's in the audience and what they're yelling or all those things. And it's very similar, um, no matter if you're competing or if you're, uh, competing in, in life, I guess, you know, to some degree. But that, that piece of the habit versus the weight, I thought it was just golden. Um, is, uh, how can you, just because I want to get this one, how can you 
um, what advice can you give to someone who is talking about, for example, clinical obesity, right? Clinical obesity is a actual, <clears throat> very real thing that could have some potential health consequences, right? So being able to convey that message, but also convey this message of clinical obesity and maybe what you look like can be two separate things, or how do we maintain both spaces where I can give a potential health message, but also um, have an acceptance message with it? Yeah, and, and something I think health at every size gets a bad reputation. Health at every mm. size is not saying that everybody is healthy at every size. Mm. Health at every size is saying that regardless of your shape and size, you should have access to health enhancing opportunities. So mm. you should be able to go to the doctor without fear of stigma or shame. You should be able to go into gym spaces without fear that people are going to look at you sideways for a long time. So mm. I do want to... Um, clarify that, but then also say that, um, on the flip side of that, a lot of experts believe that the term obesity is more of a slur than it is a useful category or descriptor. And that yeah. that word has negative undertones and a really problematic history. And it's not really a neutral way or a neutral descriptor to classify people. So, I think automatically I kind of, my guard goes up a little bit when I hear that just because I think there are plenty of people doing research in that space. And even some of the terminology that's being used immediately feels stigmatizing to mm. the clientele that they're trying to serve or trying to help. Um, but I would say that still focusing on health behaviors could improve some of the health markers of those people, regardless of their shape and their size. Um, in the same way that people who are underweight experience a lot of health risks, people on the other end of that curve also experience health risks. Mm -hmm. And knowing too that there are so many factors that go into weight and size, a lot of which are outside of a person's control. Like we've talked about the biology piece. Mm. We still have yet to really understand and comprehend the microbiome and its role in body weight and body size and shape. Mm. Um, I don't know if I answered your question very well, but um, yeah, I would say still a health at every size approach would work regardless of someone's weight or their size. Right. And I, you know, all this stuff, I think people have to reflect on who they're with and how they can deliver things in, in an appropriate way. But, <clears throat> but even just considering the fact that that might be um, triggering for someone. Now, here I am saying it. So I just have to consider that. I have to consider how this person could be potentially triggered from this or how I can deliver this message in a way that's going to keep your guard down. Just because I know as an educator, if your guard is up, you're not here, you're running from me. You're not coming toward me. So I just, I might not have the exact answer right now, but just that idea of considering who you're with and how they're going to interpret this and how you can keep them close to you and not running. Yeah, I would say choose connection <clears throat> and relationship building over everything um, because we know that healthcare avoidance is a very common thing with people who experience weight stigma. They're mm. worried that if they go in to the doctor with a cold or they go in and see someone about something that they're going to get lectured on their weight that mm. has nothing to do with what they came in to talk to that person about. Mm. So, I mean, the, just the health impacts of weight stigma to me are so far beyond the, the concerns about the actual weight and they're not accounted for in the weight loss literature. So like, mm. we're not accounting for the daily stigma experiences that people in larger bodies are faced with. We're not mm. accounting for the fact that they haven't seen a doctor in four years, four or five years, because they're they're not wanting to be lectured about their weight or they're not wanting to be weighed when they go into the doctor. Um, mm. We're not accounting for that they've been on diets almost their entire life and that they've yo-yoed, which also has health risks independent of weight loss and weight gain, you know, weight regain, but that yo-yo dieting is sort of really not great for our health. So mm. there's just so many problems with that realm of research in my mind that, um, yeah, I think 
if practitioners really want to consider a new way of helping their patients or their clients really look into health at every size, really do some internal work to figure out what are some, some of my beliefs about people in larger bodies? How mm. can I be more welcoming and, and accommodating for um, those people? And mm. I think if everyone did that, we, we might see some real, we might see the needle, uh, the needle move a little bit. I guess you mentioned the piece earlier about society, right? Like how it's important to make these changes, you know, in, on that level. Is there anything that you could maybe recommend or any advice that you, or like, what would that look like in a society or what changes could we potentially make? I know that's a big one. That's a hard one. Yeah. You know, um, there's a really good book, uh, what we don't talk about when we talk about fat and the mm -hmm. last chapter reimagines a world in which it's weight inclusive. And I wish I could read it to answer your question because she really covers so much and it's so mm. good. Um, but uh, I would say, number one, we don't need to comment on people's bodies, even when we think we're being well-meaning. Mm. So like, wow, you look great. Well, that implies that that person didn't look good before, or that person is currently battling a significant health issue and that's why they've lost weight. So I think we just really, even when we think we're being kind or well-intentioned, it's not usually helpful to comment on people's bodies or, you know, if they've lost or gained weight, not commenting on that. Um, and I think that would go a long way if we just stopped commenting on people's bodies, period. Um, but I also think to helping sort of create these more inclusive spaces, really all of us going through and doing the work of like, what are my in implicit biases against people in larger bodies? And what can I do? to kind of right some of those wrongs or what can I do to be more accepting and inclusive? Um, mm. And if we all were to do that, especially in healthcare fields and fitness fields, like I just think it could really be so transformative and um, powerful. So as we close everything out, I know we went through a lot of quick stuff. We might have to get a part two day also, but uh... <laughs> But are there any final words that you want to share? Not that you have to, but if there's anything that maybe, you know, you want to get in before we close. Um, I would say big takeaway, uh, helping people be kind to themselves is not going to result in loss of motivation. It might actually help them increase their motivation for physical activity or really any health behavior. So for people, I don't know if educators or fitness professionals are listening, but I really think that's applicable in most spaces um, if you're working with clients mm. well thank you so much for today um you know thank you for the work that you're doing as well good conversation things definitely people need to hear i often sent them a, a lot of my thought processes around motivating people because if you're not motivated you're not going to do it like that you know you could talk about what needs to get done all you want but if you don't talk about how people are going to be excited and enthusiastic to do that then you're missing the boat and that's has to be at the forefront i think it's the top of the pyramid so it's it's really important work and i appreciate the work you're doing and i'm happy you got to come on today me too thank you so much for having me this was a blast <laughs>